Hello, everyone. Um, so, um, this is what I was asked to do, okay? Um, to investigate the myriad ways in which design can function socially. That was the exercise that Adrian set me. Um, so I'm going to have a go. I'm going to have a go. Uh, we've got ten rules that we use at someone to try and make brands more socially adept. But first, a little bit of context. Over three and a half million people have seen that, and now a few more. Thank you very much. And, and I think that's kind of um, what we love doing, which is um, professional but accessible, right? Because um, what we do is we specialise in launching, relaunching, and managing brands. Uh, they are products, they are services, they are organisations. Uh, we do this through strategy, through pr new product development, staff engagement programmes, internal workshops, packaging, all sorts of stuff. And a little bit of it, a little bit of it, is the visual brand identity. And that's what they use to present themselves. Now, the thing is, um, we are not interested in asparagus, OK? Um, there is no competition in asparagus. And brands only exist where there is competition. In fact, asparagus is so brilliant, you don't even need packaging. You just need a rubber band. I can't help them. So I'm not interested in asparagus. Um, so the, the ideal position to be in if there is competition is to have a monopoly. Not a very nice word. Um, but actually, if you've got a monopoly, then you will be chosen over your competition. And that's the purpose of branding. Now, when I say monopoly, um, we don't mean going all American psycho. Okay? Um, John Lewis, uh, a very nice brand, has profit as one of its brand values, which surprised me when I first uh, heard about that. But having a monopoly uh, allows them to do nice things. Um, and great companies with clear, smart brands not only attract great staff, but they keep great staff. And that's a big business advantage. Being the best place with the best relationships means you have a monopoly on the market. Um, and, <laughs> and so this, in, in a way, marketing is very simple. Okay? So I don't know if you can see what that guy is doing there. Um, but what he's doing is he's basically doing marketing which is he's um, distracting someone, he's uh, being quite entertaining, and he's uh, using emotional connectivity to the picture. Um, and so just like this guy, he's gaining uh, an advantage over his competitor by using human understanding. And that is what kind of marketing does. Now, um, to create a monopoly, um, something about the brand needs to connect with the many, not with the few. Uh, and like the work we created with VCCP, um, this is probably one of the first socially powered brand mascots. There's always been fluffy animals in advertising, but this one kind of is more responsive to social uh, aspects. And so our, the three kind of golden rules is to be liked, which he is. In fact, he's liked so much, his autobiography outsold Golden Browns at Christmas. Um, it needs to stand out, and so this certainly stands out because it's entertaining rather than repetitive. And it needs to be useful. And uh, not, not a lot of people know this, but um, this one was, uh, when you're doing search engine optimization, the word market is actually very expensive to manage. The word meerkat, on the other hand, is quite affordable. Um, so we know that social really sells, okay? Um, it's not art. Um, art only exists for its own purpose. Um, whereas stuff that can be talked about, stuff that's designed that is social. There's no surprise that this is from the world's richest artist. Okay? So um, this is created to share. You know, it's created to sell, and it's very, very potent mix. And so if we create stuff that's headline friendly, that's Twitter friendly, um, hopefully like some of the things I'm going to say today, um, then you're, you're kind of in business. Now, I think successful branding has always worked hand in hand with society. Um, there's a great synchronicity to uh, great brands. They seem to connect effortlessly. Um, it's like that kind of the definition of cool, which is to be effortless and timely. And um, that's great. You know, that's always been the case. But the, there's a new kid in town, and and that's the kind of whole social network stuff. Now, brands don't run the show anymore. They used to. So on the left of that extremely unattractive chart. 
uh, it talks about kind of how the market was in control. People trusted brands and listened to brands. They used to trust advertising agencies and listen to advertising agencies. Um, but as things have moved on from the 50s to nowadays, um, the consumer is firmly in control because it, time and attention and trust is on the way down and product choice, the noise of the media and the ease of self-publishing is well and truly on the rise. And so the consumer, the people, own the brand. They don't just buy it, they own the brand. And this is a super massive shift that um, is affecting everyone all over the world. I first saw this chart in Africa three weeks ago. It's happening everywhere. It's not just a London-centric Soho marketing chancer. Um, it's, it's happening everywhere. So now the, the, the interesting thing is now that people now listen to people they've never met about a service they've never experienced in a place they've never been to in a country they've never visited. They listen to those people more than they do to the brands. And Leroy Six from Belgium writes on TripAdvisor that when he went to Claridge's, he thought it wasn't quite as good as the Marriott. Okay? Now, I disagree with him, I quite like Claridge's, but that will affect the brand's reputation because people are making the decisions and they are talking to each other. And so that's, that's interesting. It's no longer a kind of broadcast rubber stamp mentality for brands. It's a conversation. Now, this is a challenge, okay, because the number of people that are able to voice an opinion now um, means that stuff gets shut down quite fast, okay? Um, also, obviously, social media is all about cats, so we have got quite a few cats in this presentation. So um, stuff gets shut down almost as soon as it is created, and that can be a challenge for anything new, certainly a challenge for anything creative. A great example of this is Gapgate, okay? Gapgate, there she is, um, Marka Hansen, who's the president, of, or was the president of, of Gap. Now, you know, Gap, Gap is worth quite a lot of money, as you can see there, okay? And so traditionally, in the olden days, they would have just carried on. But because a few people on social networks complained about their logo change, they were forced to retract. Um, they actually said, there may be a time to evolve our logo, but if and when that time comes, we'll handle it differently. What? Really? Um, so that, that's amazing. And so we just thought, okay, so something's really, really going on here. So to understand um, you know, social networks and the way that design is being curated and the way it's being commissioned, it's interesting to look at how some channels work. So radio, we've kind of figured out what radio is good at. It's really good at entertaining you while you do something dull, like doing the dishes or driving a car, right? TV is really good if you just want to vegetate and sit there and do nothing. I used to work in advertising and try to do a campaign to uh, promote the red button. No one really uses it. Um, newspapers are essentially there to entertain you while you have a poo or while you're waiting for something else to happen, okay? So what is the internet good at? That's the thing. What is it really, really good at? Well, what the internet, I think, is really, really good at is entertaining the notion that people are actually interested in what you've got to say. It really encourages people to comment and it's the perfect channel for complaint. Um, and there's a phrase that kind of has been going around for quite a while around this sort of thing, which is this idea that the internet essentially means that people say, why wasn't I consulted? Okay? People get very, very angry. Um, and uh, if you look at the internet, and certainly if you're launching something new and you look at the internet, you can assume actually that there are only angry people on the internet. Um, in fact, while I was watching uh, some of the lectures this morning, someone here said, um, yeah, this place, terrible coffee. It's like, well, well, I think there's quite a lot of good things going on, but if all you were looking at was the comments, you'd imagine it's just a, a horrible coffee hellhole. Um, so, so this kind of why wasn't I consulted thing is all very well. Um, so, that, so what do we do about it, right? We're trying to be positive. Um, so um, if you think about it, the ability to self-publish, because it's really easy, the belief in entitlement of, com of having these comments and, uh, and criticisms, plus an effortless global reach, really does make it very difficult. How on earth do you do anything commercially creative, anything new, without it getting slammed before it can even prove itself? Right? Well, what do you do? Right, so we, we've got an idea. We've got an idea, a few ideas. Um, so it's, it's interesting to kind of work out um, where things' homes are, where things live comfortably, so that your work isn't instantly rejected by those homes. Okay? So if traditional media is a one-way uh, broadcast, um, the natural habitat for brands, okay? Uh, uh, broadcast, it allows you to rubber stamp your logo. Well done, you've got a logo. 
Um, and um, that's it, okay? So good, good for you, broadcast brands. Social media is conversational, right? And so that's the home of people, not brands. It's always a bit weird when you have a brand that's got a Facebook page or a Twitter account. So the only reason really um, to be included in this stuff is to make the conversation more interesting. And traditional brand activity is just really annoying, okay? Um, you know, you're, you're on a bus, you're on a bus, and you're, you're sitting at the front of the bus, and you see a big poster, and the big poster says, pedigree chum. And you go, I'm on a bus. I, I know you want me to buy dog food. I can't buy dog food. I'm on a bus, right? And then you just go, actually, go away, go away. I don't even have a dog, right? And so it's just annoying. It's getting in the way of this stuff. Um, so truthfully, you know, socially successful design and socially successful branding and brands only really need um, one thing. And that is um, to realize that you can only be famous for one thing. Okay? You need to decide what your opinion is. Um, you need to stand for something. A brand that tries to appeal to everyone is doing blanding, not branding. Okay? Great brands are divisive. Okay? You can't appeal to everyone. They have principles, um, and that's important. It's really important for brands to have that. Most brands are um, absolutely terrified of principles. They, they do this sort of thing. You know, these are my principles, but if you don't like them, I've got others. Um, and they don't stick to their guns, okay? Because principles can cost you money. And actually, a principle is only a principle if it costs you money. Um, and the thing with that is, though, that the principles and opinions and ideas um, create monopolies. They drive sales. John Lewis has a very strong one, never, never knowingly undersold. They have to refund hundreds of thousands of pounds a year, but they make an awful lot more because they have a principle and people believe in them, they understand them, okay? So it's not about having a positioning, okay? Positioning is marketing and therefore evil, okay? It's about having a position, okay, an opinion. That's interesting, that's conversational. So opinions drive products, they drive services, they drive organizations, okay? They drive the brand. Um, opinions create monopolies. And so what we do is we amplify opinions. Um, and of course, th these drive conversations, and therefore, opinions are social, which is, of course, today's theme. So with that in mind, I think it's really useful that we look at branding in a different way, okay? That we rethink some of the traditions of branding. Clint. Hey, Clint, doesn't he look lovely there? Um, and so when a brand says it's going to do social, stand well back, it's going to be a car crash, okay, or a boat crash. Most of the images I've seen, you've used here <laughs> are animated GIFs. This is probably the ultimate animated GIF. <laughs> They're designed in an amazing way. They're designed to be shared, right? Uh, they are weird, they are entertaining, they are terrifying, um, and they connect with people like we've done tonight here. There we go. So we want to do that for brands. We want to connect people. I have to turn it off because otherwise no one listens, yeah? But uh, really, you know, look at the guy when he finally goes. He's thinking, this is fine, this is fine. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so, you know, when we created the uh, branding for GIFGAF, okay, um, the, the kind of people-powered network, some of you might have it. I hope it's, I hope it's all right. Um, uh, we created not the blackboard, but um, and so not the kind of the marks on the blackboard, we created the blackboard, okay? So we created ways for people to do their own thing, okay? We, we just created tools to get involved. So I didn't do that. None of our, our, our people did that. Other people did that. And that's great. We just let it go and let people do it. And it's branded because it's within a set, set of parameters, really. Um, and I think that in branding now, we need to give more than we take. Um, and people... Are, will then be encouraged to actually give a shit. The biggest mistake you can make is that to assume that people are interested. They're not. You're just getting in their way. So if we create the blackboard rather than the marks on the board, then we invite people to get involved. And that's social and interesting. So now, with that in mind, that context, I'm going to dash through the kind of 10 things that we think about when we're creating new visual brand identities that are trying to be more socially useful. So, unlike Bibliotech, I can't stand consistency. 
Uh, I, I think it's incredibly boring, okay? I think that people desire stimulation, okay? There's no wonder that um, Lego is one of the most successful things of all time. It's because it's consistent in as much as it's always Lego, but you can do amazing things with it. It can be stimulating, it can be interesting, but it's always Lego, and that's fine, that's great. But I think that this is consistency. This is solitary confinement. Um, it's very dull, it's deeply repetitive, and it's highly predictable. And I don't know a single brand that would like those brand values. They are also deeply antisocial. Um, and, you know, it's, consistency is, a, is just a hangover from days past, because consistency was fine when all you had was a name, a colour, a typeface, and a symbol. Because then you could turn up the volume of various bits, and well done, you've branded it. But that doesn't work anymore because the channels are infinite. They are much harder to con control. Um, it's not about being consistent. It's about being coherent. Okay? Um, it's too complex to try and limit down a brand to a single logo um, because then you're basically doing a TV ad that has to look good on a pencil. It just doesn't work. So we think that it's better to create a world of things okay, to help create coherent conversations. It's like a band of hamsters, um, that, that suddenly things can join up and be coherent. Now, someone much smarter than me, Richard P. Remelt, said in Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, great book, recommend it, uh, that a coherent strategy coordinates policies and actions. And most organizations don't do this because they're all over the place doing stuff. So it's great to be coherent for organizations, products and services, right? But we need to remember that the challenge never, change, uh, never stays still. It's always, always changing. Um, and things that adapt all the time. So brands should adapt all the time. It's ridiculous to create a, a logo in a corner office and expect it to last for 100 years because it's not going to work. Most importantly, a brand is not what it says. It's what it does. Okay? We all saw Stratos. Okay? Um, and if you, look, if you look at the latest Red Bull advertising, there's no drinking shot, which is heresy, absolute heresy in marketing terms. There's no, they just have Formula One, Flug Tag, they have the Art of Flight, which if you haven't seen, is an amazing film. So they do amazing stuff. And of course, Stratos, my God, did that create some blogging? Did that create some column inches? Seven million people watched it live, and I bet you another 100 million people will see it online. And it's gone on to create its own wonderful things that you couldn't predict, but are a completely <laughs> wonderful. There he goes, there he goes. Yeah. Um, and and that's, that's exactly what you want from, from brands, okay? I'm going to have to turn this off because you are going to just keep laughing. There he goes. So, you know, one of the things that brands do, okay, is they create a visual brand identity. And that's not to be sneered at. But um, if, you, if you just rub a stamp the same thing over and over, I mean, that is over, isn't it? You know, how can you, how can you join things up in a more intelligent way across multiple channels? Does this really do Virgin Atlantic the favours that it deserves? It's a brilliant service, but God dear. So, um, we think that logos are very rarely conversational. Very, very rarely. In fact, I think they are what designers want to create, not what the public demands. Um, they're red herrings, um, and I'll prove it. I'm going to try and prove it, you doubters. Um, so I think that they need to move away from this one-way, mirrored glass, logo-based branding approach, okay? Because all you can see is yourself, okay? If you're turning around and trying to look at your customer, then you need a different approach. You need a people-powered series of choices, okay? Now, the thing is, if you've got a logo, right? When I say a logo, I mean this sort of thing, okay? When you have a logo, all you can do is this kind of social grenade. Can you imagine being at the launch of this? It must have been... Oh, so embarrassing, okay? And, and all of these things are awful. I mean, they're just, uh, what do they mean? Another swoosh, well done, very good, okay? And rather than just taste, you know, actually the public hates new logos, right? They're always too expensive. They're never seen as useful. They're just arty rubbish that someone's done, and my God, a cat could have done that. When TGV rebranded um, fairly recently in France, the train company, um, Someone took this, because all they did is they launched the logo. Someone took it, spun it around, and went, it's a bit like your service, isn't it? <laughs> Suddenly, the entire marketing budget they've just spent is down the toilet. Okay? The press hate new logos. I've never read a review in The Sun saying, oh, fantastic, new logo in the house. Okay? They always just say, how much was that? It looks like a company in trouble to me. Does it look like Lisa Simpson? Uh, um, they should spend that somewhere else, okay? 
And the, the problem is that the press love to talk about the cost of a new brand identity, but never the value of a new brand identity. So if all you have is a new logo, and it's not supported by a new and useful and beneficial story, then you will get a story about how your graphic designer just got 211 million pounds for drawing a green flower. Okay? That's not useful for branding. Also, the staff, let's not forget the people that work at these organizations, they hate them. They always like the old one. Uh, they're always a bit worried that, oh, have we been sold then? And, oh, have I got a new boss? And, oh, is my job safe? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave. I'm going to leave. It panics people. And business hates new logos. It's never a, a clear indication of what's going on. It takes the focus off the uh, core product. Uh, it's never reassuring to the city. Uh, you often see share prices going down after a rebrand. Um, it's never seen as a good signal to staff, and it's never a good use of funds. And my God, the internet hates new logos. They, people mess them up, they don't work small, they're not conversational, and you can't delete the old ones. For me, that is a lot of hate, okay? An awful lot of hate. Because with a logo, all you can do is burn it into the back of a cow. That's why it's called branding, yeah? So you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, or you can repeat it. Uh, logos inherit meaning. They are born useless. And transmedia or multi-channel or whatever you want to call it demands an approach that's instantly useful because broadcast, I think we've established, is dead and that conversations are ruling. Also, logos are everywhere. I mean, why do you want to join the party? They're omnipresent. I actually commissioned um, a company called infinitylogo.com to rebrand someone. They did this for $20 and it took them six months. However, this probably took the same amount of time, but cost considerably more. But was it worth it? I mean, does anyone really notice? Is any of this stuff actually worth it? So I would say that if you, all you've got is a logo, you can put it on stuff, well done, really good. So I'd suggest that in contemporary branding, logo is dying. So fair enough. Logos don't rock. I think I've made my point. So what do you do if you can't badge stuff? Okay. Well, I'll show you. What you can do is you can do stuff like this, for example. So branding that's responsive to social data. Uh, we started conversations with a big company called Accenture um, to b by basically showing that we're listening to people. So what we created um, with Field uh, was a series of um, interactive pieces that were responsive to social data. Okay? So um, you typed into a central database um, some variables that connected to the industry sector, the, the current brand identity that they've got, the name, the founding year of that thing, the market capital, the online and social influence, and the share price, right? And what you got were these little seeds, okay? And these little seeds represented each of the um, companies directly. But what was interesting is that if your company had recently had turmoil on the, on the stock markets, you'd look a bit swirly, right? Um, but if you actually were quite solid, you'd look quite rigid. And so when people were coming along to speak to Accenture, they'd kind of say to them, yeah, you know, what's all this landscape stuff about? It looks very nice and everything, but I don't understand it. He goes, oh, it's your company. I go, what? Sorry? He goes, well, actually, this is all based on your data that's socially available, which started a conversation straight away. And it also created these amazing landscapes that change and adapt hourly so that when you're actually talking to Accenture in one of their rooms, this thing is changing behind you. And so what's really cool about this is that these landscapes opened a conversation and reflected the challenges of the company. And they were different for every single brand. And they continue to be different because they are generative pieces of art or patterning. Now, what was cool about this is that we created these patterns that then we could use on invitations. Sorry, Tony, didn't get one. Um, but, uh, you know, these are laser-cut wood, so he, he would have probably loved it. Um, but um, they are, they're laser-cut wood, but the, what's good about this is that the pattern changes for each person, right? And they are accompanied by printed uh, information as well. And each of these is different, but when you come together, you realize, oh, we're all part of the same company. But you never forget that you are an individual, and it's printed digitally, so everything is capable to be highly customized. So the whole branding experience joins up, and hey, guess what? There's no logo. So th this is cool because it created nice things. So depending on where you sat in the office, you might get a mouse mat like, like that, or a ma mouse mat like that. It was fueled by the position in the office. It created merchandise that people actually wanted. And your business card was basically created by your phone number. So you created 
a data port that you can put your phone number in and it created your own pattern. So depending on where you are in the entire organization, the pattern changes and is branding spaces. So this creates a very interesting, very flexible, totally cohesive and connective, opinionated brand world, which is logo-free. Sometimes you, can, you, you kind of need to do other things. Um, sometimes uh, you get big projects um, that you need to approach differently. So when you're working with a World Heritage Site, things need to kind of grow up a little bit and you have to ask yourself what's really going on. So when you're rebranding the National Maritime Museum, the Queen's House, the Planetarium and the Royal Observatory Greenwich, you have to really think what you're doing because it's going to be around for a long time. Sometimes a client really wants a logo uh, and so that doesn't really mean that you have to give them one, okay? It doesn't mean that you have to think about, oh, will it fax? You know, who's got faxes these days anyway? Um, what we want to do is we want to give people more, not less, okay? So what did we do? Well, we, I think we over-delivered. Um, we, we created uh, CGI water splashes that look amazing big and beautiful small. And it opens a conversation because the point here is not a lot of people know why these places are actually there, but they're all joined up to the river, which is joined to the sea, and it talks about our maritime history. So water is everything. And if you can make it look good on a mug, I think you probably can make it look good anywhere. Um, and the, the Royal Museums in Greenwich are now united by this story of the sea, which they've always been united by that, but people just didn't know it. And you can start to understand why they're there and what they're about, so it's conversational. Also, there's some nice little hidden things in there as well. So for the observat observatory, we've got um, these little droplets that are up there, and they're not just random. They are um, placed in uh, one of the most recognisable constellations in the sky, the Seven Sisters. Um, and so this is great for the Royal Observatory because they start to talk about conversationally to people that are not normally interested. Hey, well, yeah, have you seen? We've even got the Seven Sisters in our branding. Oh, OK. And it was useful from day one, okay? connected the sites. They're actually quite a long way away from each other. You have to walk for about 15 minutes from one to the other. So they used to lose people along the way. They don't anymore. And actually, it's joined up an awful lot of diverse and interesting things that they do, but that previously had no connection to each other. So uh, it's truly multi-channel. And it got everyone happy. So let's not forget the people that work there who do the brilliant job that they do. Um, this was designed for um, a bit of merchandise. We were going to sell some T-shirts. Uh, but the staff loved them so much, they turned into their uniform. That's great. And people started to be able to talk to people. about Oh, you, do, you know why it's water? Oh, OK, OK. And it becomes conversational, which we like. And it's good. There's another challenge you've got, okay? So sometimes when you're working with really big companies, is how on earth do you get everyone to agree? Okay, it's a really tough one. Multiple stakeholder engagement. Oh, yes, it's very difficult. Um, and, and, and this is another kind of social challenge. It's a social challenge within an organisation. Um, so for the Olympics, we created a socially powered design system which sounds terribly exciting, but really um, it came from uh, the Vancouver a brand world that they created using these illustrations. We really liked the characters, uh, just like Mario and Co. You knew they were all part of the same game. So we were getting involved in, in talking about the characters and stuff. And then we looked at what other Olympics have created for their character systems, and it's either dreadful cultural cliché, I mean, really, is a boomerang the best we can do for Sydney? Um, or they look like something that should be on a toilet door. And that doesn't really do anything for the kind of dynamism and excitement that we saw at the Olympics. So how do you represent that and get everyone to agree? So we took the typeface, and we are at Typo 2012, so there's a typeface involved, um, and we took it apart. Um, and so all the composite bits are on the right-hand side there. They make the typeface. We then got people to send us what they thought was the quintessential sporting pose. So if it's in boxing, who does the perfect jab? If it's in football, who kicks the ball perfectly? And of course, who's the best Chris Hoy? I mean, cyclist. Um, and then we overlay those elements on top of it, which creates that, which becomes that. And then you get your icon, okay? So no one could complain, because they said, well, you've given us the perfect thing. We've just overlaid the agreed system to it, which was picked up by the press. We had nothing to do with this. But then people started to say, oh, I see, it's the quintessential example of sport. LeBron is the daddy of basketball. And look, it looks exactly like the icon and the pictogram. Brilliant. Job done. Pub o'clock. Well, actually, no. We decided to um, make it much harder for ourselves and chase the opportunity, not the money, um, and um, expanded upon it. And instead of just doing 57 icons for 10 clients each, 
plus the IOC, so about 650 clients. Um, quite a challenge. You think it's hard enough to please five people. Try that. Um, then we expanded it and said, okay, the, 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 the most iconic thing about London that people buy and take home when they, when they visit our glorious city is the underground map. So let's embrace that and use that to talk about the connective joining in legacy of the Olympics. So we then created another 57 icons. Now, there's a lot of live surface and Photoshop in, in uh, branding that you kind of show what it's going to look like, but this is not Photoshop, this is for real. Um, that's what it looked like in the Olympic Park. And uh, when I was walking around it, I was like, I, ca I can't believe it, it's brilliant. And we didn't do it. We didn't do that stuff, we didn't apply it. We just created the, the stuff and gave it away. And it's been applied perfectly and was applied perfectly. And it looked great. And if that was a toilet sign, that size, even though it's on silk, it still wouldn't look that great. Um, it certainly wouldn't look that great if you if it kind of four stories high, which I think it does there. So the, the, the great thing with this, and it was socially powered because there were so many people involved in making this stuff and actually creating this stuff, we, there's no way one person could have done all of that, and they didn't, there's lots of people, but it branded everything in a very nice, joined up, cohesive, interesting, conversational way. Um, even the duvet covers that um, saw quite a lot of action. So um, that's, that's good. So th then the other idea is you kind of go, okay, um, what about um, this big marketing idea or the kind of actually a big creative design idea that has to be one big idea? Well, we think that's not necessarily the case. That actually it's about having hundreds of ideas, not one idea. Because, um, you know, one idea is really powerful. That can, can connect with a few people. Two ideas, more likely to get a few more. And actually, wh why not do three? Why not do five? Why not do 150? And w so we call that brand worlds. Um, so having m many ideas, giving more than you take in an interesting way. And what's good about this stuff is that, you know, you don't have to be 100% right on everything. You don't have to be so uptight. Oh, God, don't let it out of the studio. It's like, well, let just publish you know, launch and learn. Don't just perfect and, you know, get all upside, uh, upset about it all. And that's because, you know, and again, I didn't say this, but, you know, you don't have to get things totally right. You just have to be more right than your competitor. So for Eurostar, which we rebranded, um, we just uh, were a lot more right than the competitors, okay? Um, and in fact, because they're a classic brand, because they're multi-channel, they really benefit from multiple ideas. So we created hundreds and hundreds of ideas uh, to cr all over different touch points, not when one big marketing one. We did sculptures that change and adapt, iconography that was useful from day one, digital that talked about the multiple levels of service, were, um, uh, made the website much easier to understand and use, 20% faster, a bespoke typeface, everything joined up, and it became a symbol of change, not just a change of symbol. Which sounds really smug, okay, but it was simply there to be an indicator that they've just invested 700 million pounds in their fleet. So where you saw the new stuff, you saw this. The other thing we try and do is find ownable moments, okay? Positive aspects of the conversation that are hard to replicate. So for two, the Telefonica digital brand, um, we owned gestures. So the idea of pushing that up and down on your screen made a brand, which was then expanded into a brand world with typefaces and colours and exciting things. We, we owned the definitive athletic poses for the Olympics. For a Catherine's football team, um, we um, went back to what historically they use, which is Lily White. Um, for Valio, which is uh, Finland's largest dairy company, we created a changing seasonal pack that um, travels along that landscape as the, the season continues, right? So you get lovely packaging that's changing and adaptive and conversational when it's on your breakfast table. We've, last week we launched this, which owns an art movement. So it, it can do all sorts of interesting things that don't need to rely on logos. So, I'm nearly there, okay? So um, for all this stuff to happen, I think that we, we collectively, as the kind of creative community, uh, do need to address an old issue. And it's kind of a call to arms, and it's business versus design. Um, this is the image that comes up in Google Images when you type in design. This is what business thinks designers are, okay? Some of you may do this after hours, and that's fine, okay? But, um, but it's slightly misrepresenting design, I think. Um, and the other thing is that um, there's not really a place on the boardroom or in the boardroom for designers. I was at a um, thing recently where, um, like these pigs, sorry, pigs, um, these three pigs, um, 
they, they, they can't get to the trough, you see, the one in the middle can't get to the trough. So I was at, I was at this thing recently where um, uh, someone's, it was all CEOs and big wigs, and uh, they said, oh, what do you do? And I said, oh, I run a design practice. And they went, oh, are they letting designers in here now? Um, and I said, oh, yeah, cheers. Uh, well, I, I can see your brand's not doing very well because you're not letting design in the boardroom. And he said, yeah, you're right, we should have a chat. So um, it's true that we're not often allowed at the top level to affect change. And that's because at the heart of design lies creativity. Uh, and creativity scares the pants off people. And, and the truth is that business is about management. It's about margin, growth, profit, cash flow. Okay? Whereas, so business is absolutely risk averse, whereas creativity is all risk. And it really is all risk. If, if one sector could have bottled creativity, it would have been Hollywood. And the thing is that Hollywood gets it wrong, okay? So hun nearly $110 million was lost on the Green Lantern. I haven't seen it. I, I don't know if it's any good or not, but it should have been great. Ryan Reynolds and all that lot, yeah, great. But it collapsed and fell down because creativity was involved. And so the best definition of creativity I've ever heard is not knowing. We work in not knowing. And that's scary. So the thing is, what do you do with that? It's like, well, actually, the smart clients are the ones that are less scared. Uh, and they are saying the right kind of things, okay? So that the smart clients are saying things like, you know, we need more magic and less logic. This was said by the top guys at Unilever recently. And because design and creativity is the only opportunity for business not just to be business. But it's a conundrum. It's a really strange conundrum. Um, because um, what business asks design is, um, it says, you know, make me famous, connect with the masses, Make me rich, create a monopoly by any means necessary. And, and design goes, trust the risky weirdo called creativity. We can't guarantee a result, but we'll have a go. And I think that we're in really an educated purchase. I think it's very like yogurt, right? Can you imagine the first time that someone came out into a kind of breakfast room and said, I've got a little pot here, it's milk, it's off, but I put a strawberry in it. <laughs> uh, and, and people go, oh, oh, I don't want anything to do with that. But if you educate people, if you go, no, seriously, it's really good, it's good for you and the rest of it, people will try it and then boom, yogurt is born. Okay? So, so what do you do in all these situations? Um, it's all a bit gloomy. Well, um, we believe that weird works. Okay? And this is an extremely good example of weird working right now. Um, and, uh, and, and creativity produces weird stuff. Okay? Um, have it, has anyone seen this before? Um, so, so this guy loved his cat so much when the cat died, he turned it into a helicopter. Um, now, and that's weird, right? Okay, it's really, really weird. But it's what's remembered, okay? No one will remember the colour of the carpet by the end of the day, right? No one goes and goes, do you know what? Blue carpet, amazing, right? People will remember that they were driving home and an owl hit the windscreen, okay? Weird stuff is what sticks in people's minds. And that stands out, and that creates monopolies for brands. So... It, it's conversational, it's all good, right? But it's scary. So I think what we need to do, what we need to believe, and that's not me, uh, what we need to believe is um, that we are not in the design business, we are in the people business, okay? And if we can educate people, ideally the clients, um, to believe, then we will get great work out, okay? Th there's a million reasons why great work should never have run, okay? Every great campaign, every great identity, you can find flaws in it, so, for example, the Guinness Surfer, probably one of the greatest ads, uh, or Smash the Martians, right? But you, you look at this and you just go, sorry, uh, a goofy surfer what, with a big gappy smile, with, with no drinking shot, and Moby Dick with horses. You know, there's a million reasons why this should never have happened. But it did, and it caused a commotion and made Guinness an awful lot of money. So, when you have an educated client, um, brilliant things happen. They can change things. They can radically change things. Compare the market was the last to the market. Okay, there was Confuse.com, Go Compare, and all that stuff, right? And they were the last. But now they lead the market because they understood that one of the most popular things you can do is put something fluffy on the screen and make it do something amusing. It's one of the most searched-for things on the internet. So they embraced that, and now they lead the market. O2, one of our clients, um, spends the least, actually, but it has the most share of voice. I mean, the, the business bit, you know, it's valued at 18 billion pounds, and 6 billion pounds worth of that is the brand. 
That's why it's worth doing for b brands and for businesses all over the world. And they believe in the power of coherent brand worlds, not consistency. That bubble changes all the time. So people need to understand, designers need to understand, that creativity is terrifying, absolutely terrifying, okay? Um, and it's, uh, people will say, oh, you know, it's, it's a new brand, it's a new idea, it's like a child. No, it's not. No one likes other people's children, okay? Um, a, a great idea is a tarantula, okay? If you don't know what you're doing, it will go in your mouth, okay? And it'll do something horrible. But if you know what you're doing and you release it at the right time, you'll get an amazing effect and you'll never be um, forgotten or forgiven. Um, so business is risk-averse, creativity is risk-loving, Business is all about knowing, creativity is all about not knowing, and business is all about the familiar, whereas great, great creativity is about the weird. So what do we do? Well, we do what the coolest billionaire in the world does, and says, and that's not Photoshop, by the way, that is 100% real. Um, uh, he says, screw business as usual. Um, and winning companies are placing design at their heart. Virgin, Apple, Hermes, they all put design on the boardroom. And in his book... Um, you should re read one of his books, they're really good. Um, he says, stick to what you know, deliver on your promises, which sounds so underwhelming. But design's promise, when delivered, is really about the educated application of creativity. Okay? That's not us pretending to be businessmen and all that sort of stuff. It's helping business be better business. And so to help, new business, help any business, we need to make friends of clients. We need to be social. And uh, you know, enthusiasm really does... Uh, win over talent. There have been studies recently. They've actually proven it. They put little microphones on you. Um, so it's really important to be social with clients. Are, are there any clients in the house? My point, exactly. Um, so next time, bring clients with you. They love this stuff. Okay? It's interesting to them. It's not talking about margins and growth and management. It's talking about ideas. Much more interesting. Ninth point, nearly there, is... Um, to move, what we need to do is move from being a cost to an asset, okay? So when they were building the gherkin, and that's the, the roof of the gherkin, the, the, the top bit, the, the architect was like, now, what are we going to do now? Just a couple more million, and we're going to do the top, okay? It's going to be really good. And they're like, oh, seriously, really? He goes, no, but it'll be all right, because we can turn it into a restaurant and invite everyone from all over the world to go there and see what it's all about. Oh, okay, asset, like it. So it's only ever seen, design is only ever seen as a worthy addition to the boardroom when this stuff happens. So, for example, you know, with socially available stuff and without any guidance, how on earth do you get coherence? How on earth do you do good stuff? How do you manage it? It's a designer's nightmare. Well, we think that the, the core rule is really give more than you take. Okay? We think it's a bit like plates. right? So um, if, if we handed those plates out and we had a nice dinner, everyone would have kind of a, a brand world. right? They'd all be part of the same thing, they, but there's a different plate, it's individual, it's interesting, and you choose the one you like. Okay? We've just created a new brand for, um, uh, uh, called Tizen. Okay? And Tizen is an operating system, and it's open source, which means you can take it apart and do whatever you want with it. So we've created a brand that you can take apart and do whatever you want with it. There's no brand guidelines, there's just a series of assets. Um, that you can play with, toys you can play with, um, not endless guidelines. So like the operating system, you can take it apart and do good stuff with it. So you can do stuff that you want. No one likes being told what to do. That's the thing, right? Any designer in here that gets brand guidelines that someone else has written, the first thing you do is go, yeah, 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 okay. And you just don't look at it, okay? But if you've got loads of good stuff, you go, ooh, okay, that's interesting. So it unites people, it unites brands. Um, it, it can be all crafted by hand. This wasn't CGI or anything. We actually made it. Uh, it's useful, it's simple, it's helpful from day one. Um, you can make it your own, you can change it, you can do all sorts of lovely things with it. Lots of cool stuff, not a million-page PDF in sight um, and it's useful from day one and very very flexible so it's designed to change and that's the business we're in without change we're all out of a job so we should be creating stuff that embraces that change more so then you can create hundreds of assets not costs available from day one for people to choose and use and enjoy the last point is our thing from the day one um, uh, I mean, obviously, the best, one of my favourites. Um, I could watch this forever. Um, our, our mantra is um, to do interesting work for enough money so we can have some fun along the way, okay? We have a lot of fun. At, uh, so we muck about an awful lot. And we chase the opportunity, not the money. It probably won't make us rich, but I think it creates much better work. So that's our top ten thing 
make things co um, coherent, forget about consistency, do more than a logo, brand without badging, one big idea is not the big idea, own moments, remove the fear for clients, remember that weird works, make it people-centric, create assets, not costs, and chase the opportunity. And that is us.